Album retrati, lura fizmi, lura fizmi, pajis motivo, milli na fi, milli na fi, ti hapet nio, pla matrit, po kem nishti, impar al ftit, li erja da kizmin mil ti, li erja da kizmin mil ti. L'ura fizmin, l'ura t'ini parti. Irpilija min dak l'inċident. Il-bnidem kien dejjem determinat. Han komplunaraw il-tini parti. Han komplunaraw il-bluebird. Il-bluebird ta' fuq l-bahar u il-bluebird ta' fuq l-art. Donald Campbell blamed his crash on a poor quality track. A search began on the far side of the world for a better course for the next record attempt. We actually spent about two months in Australia just looking somewhere that was it was going to be possible to do the record attempt so we're getting a bit desperate to be honest and we saw this great expanse of dried out salt lake lake air the rebuilt bluebird was shipped out to lake air much of the old car had been salvaged and a fin had been added to keep her stable at high speeds. After his Bonneville crash, the pressure had redoubled. What Campbell needed was a swift, successful run. But in March 1963, in one of the driest places on Earth, the unthinkable happened. I hadn't experienced rain for years, and you know, the British get there and it blooming rains. They'd have trials, the salt would break because it had got wet, the car would get stuck. Fraught was the word. The final storm that completely washed him out was really cataclysmic. It started with a really tempestuous wind. People scurrying everywhere, tying stuff down, and then suddenly the sky went black. It was doom. It was it really was the end of the world. After three frustrating months, Campbell called off the record attempt. Bluebird's backers still had nothing to show for their investment. I think back in the UK, there was doubt as to whether Donald was going to do it. There was certainly a feeling he was fated, that he was just unlucky and it, it wasn't going to happen for him. the press tore into Campbell. They claimed he had lost his nerve. Far more worrying was the criticism from CN7's most important financial backer, the industrialist Sir Alfred Owen. Well, the sponsoring committee have been bitterly disappointed at the slow rate of progress since the car was completed, and uh, I think are bound to question Donald Campbell very seriously as to why this delay has taken place. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure now to introduce, at the very moment, this controversial figure, Mr. Donald Campbell. With his reputation and his record attempt on the line, Campbell was forced to confront his critics. <laughs> well, it, 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 it's so incomprehensible to us who are engaged on the uh, operation, it's easy to say, 
when you've judged something from 14,000 miles away, sitting in the comfort of a plush office, uh, time was wasted. Uh, but those in the field uh, know very differently. Why do you think Sir Alfred has been attacking you in this manner? Oh, I don't know, David. Uh, frankly, it, it's incomprehensible to me. And uh, obviously a matter of, of, of deep regret. Some of Campbell's financial backers pulled out. His hopes of setting a land speed record were on a knife edge. And then, from the Bonneville Salt Flats, came another hammer blow. On the morning of August 5th, 1963, Breedlove goes after the record. Craig Breedlove had built his jet car himself. The American made record-breaking look easy. Spirit of America was not technically a car. Its jet engine did not drive the wheels. 407 miles an hour was an unofficial world record. But what mattered was that Breedlove, not Campbell, was now the most famous record breaker on earth. He had a reception for me after I broke the 400 record at his home in Surrey. The motoring press picked me up at my hotel in London and drove me out there, and I know they were all anticipating, you know, throwing the new record holder in front of Campbell and, and seeing, you know, him kind of upset because I had broken the record. And, you know, he, he couldn't have been nicer. I mean, that almost brings tears to my eyes to think about it. He made me feel so comfortable and so at home and so welcome. By now, Campbell was seen as a liability. More sponsors pulled out. But enough money was scraped together for one final attempt on the land speed record. I was working on the Sunday Times as a young reporter. It was suggested to me that there might be a story about the fact he was going out to get the world record. I just thought he was a sort of playboy, to tell you the truth. I thought he was a playboy, um, cashing in on his father's reputation to have a good time and make a lot of money. And that was the image I think most people had of poor old Donald at that time. I was very young then and I'm very old now. Now that I have a chance to think about him, I think everyone got him wrong, including me. What he really was behind all this, I think was a genuine tragic figure. What one was watching was a man who really was on trial for his life. The rains had come time and again, and the salt, which should have been solid for his car to race on, had turned to mush, and the salt crystals had become separated from the water, so that any car which went across it at any speed would have the tires ripped off. I mean, he really was scared stiff, to be quite honest about it. But he could not go away from that place without the record. One more assault on that elusive record. A cough, a whine, an eerie scream shatters the tomb like stillness. Move out of control. Check the recorder's running. Brakes at 8,000. Rolling now. Increasing 100% power. Compress up. 12,000. Acceleration 0.65. Speed 150. Three miles to go. To set a land speed record, Campbell would need to drive the course twice. Timers would take the average across both of the runs. He did the first run, which got him the record, on that one journey. 
I think they had something like 17 layers of paper-thin rubber and nylon on these whacking great tires. And I think they were down to the last five layers. And if that layer had got punctured, the whole thing would have blown up and he'd have been killed. And that was the point at which he says, he looked in the windscreen and there was the image of his old father. And he had a half smile on his face and he looked down. He said, don't worry, old boy, it'll be all right. Don't worry, old boy, it'll be all right. Donald turned the car around. The necessary two runs have been made. The tires are in ribbons. Now they must wait, for this is the end. The clock will give its answer. Success! A new world record. 423.1 miles per hour. The fastest ever achieved on four wheels. After seven years of blood, sweat and tears, Bluebird had finally broken the 400-mile barrier. Campbell was officially the fastest man on earth. But for one of his closest associates, the euphoria was short-lived. It turned a bit sour for me quite quickly because Donald said that um, I'd made a fortune out of him, which wasn't actually true. And he refused to pay me the balance of the money. So I said, well, in that case, you can do the water vehicle on your own and I'm going back to England and I'll put it in the hands of lawyers. To Campbell's critics, 403 miles an hour was, to say the least, a qualified success. It was slower than Breedlove's unofficial record and way short of the 500 for which CN7 had been originally designed. Campbell had another ace to play. That old stalwart, K7, had been shipped out to Australia. No one had ever broken land and water speed records in the same year. On the last day of 1964, he went for an historic double. Campbell's greatest triumph. Finally, he had proved himself the old man's equal and written his name in the history books. And then he got the water record. And despite everything, I knew just what that meant to him. That was the one thing his father had never done. And although we'd had this fight over money, I was still very fond of him. So I decided that I would send him a telegram of congratulations. So I spent hours writing it overnight and was finally quite pleased with the result. Congratulations on getting the water record, Donald. You're now not only the biggest, but the fastest bastard on earth. When we did parades through Adelaide or Sydney, it was quite extraordinary, the response to him. In London, uh, it really wasn't. It, he really did seem a man up, m more and more out of his time. You must remember this was the mid-60s, and by that time, the whole 60s social revolution was in, in full swing, and the one thing one really couldn't be in the 60s and be successful was to be square. 
favourite team, old boy. We're all playing for the same team, as it so happens, and we're now at the moment in our, in our national fortunes are at a fairly low ebb. But I believe deeply and profoundly that anything and whatever we're doing, we must redouble our efforts. As he said to me the first time, well, old boy, I'm a king and country man. I thought, God, king and country, what the hell are you on about? With the public appetite for record-breaking on the wane, many felt it was time for Campbell to retire. But racing was the only life he had ever known. You break your record, and everyone says, slap on the back, well done, fantastic, here you are, your world record-breaker. And the next day, you wake up and think, what am I going to do today? So you end up on this treadmill of going from record to record to record to record. At what point where, you know, there's a beginning, where is that end? In November 1965, Craig Breedlove raised the land speed record to 600 miles an hour. What Campbell needed in his transatlantic duel was a groundbreaking new vehicle. A rocket car, which would smash the sound barrier and seize back the land speed record for the British. Ken Norris had come up with this design. The calculations that were done showed that it would be capable of at least 850 miles an hour. A mock-up was built for the press to see, but um, no, there was really no interest from industry. And so Donald knew he'd got to do something more to get some backing from somewhere. I saw him back at his house in England. He said, I've still got the old boat. Thank God I've got it. I can have another go and keep the show on the road by going for the world water speed record. And we went and saw the old boat and it it didn't look particularly impressive, I must say. I was in the garage and he was going to have to refurbish it and all the rest of it. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, well, he said, I, I think it'll probably kill me, but I've got to do it. Campbell's sponsors had deserted him. He was broke. But if he could smash the 300 mile an hour barrier on water, he might get the money he needed to build his rocket car. World speed record holder Donald Campbell has announced that he is to attempt raising his own record over 300 miles per hour. The attempt will be made at Coniston and Bassendale. When we came back 67, the operation has been done on a shoestring. We all knew that money was tight, but once you were committed to doing it, there was really no way out. The first thing that sort of really went wrong was that they were uh, doing static tests, which they always did with the engine. And it sucked bits of plastic and rivets through the turbine, which damaged a lot of the blades. So that engine was actually wrecked. The heartbreak of this project is that you are not only fighting the unknown with the technicalities involved, but you are being continually frustrated by this appalling weather. The weather was abysmal at times. It would be days on end when there was just white horses riding down the lake. As weeks of delay turned into months, the press rounded on Campbell. He was out of touch. No one was interested in his record-breaking anymore. This isn't done for public appeal. It isn't done as a public entertainment. If I was putting on a theatrical play and nobody wanted to roll up and watch it, I should be very worried. This isn't put on as a public entertainment. Why is it put on? It's put on to try and reach a certain goal, which is to see a British boat eventually first pass the magic 300 mark. And we don't intend to stop or spare any effort to get it. What others like to think about it is their business. The last record attempt 
that was difficult because I was against it and I had a premonition which I only knew high thought. And I told him so. I said, I know you want to do this and I'm dead against it. I don't feel right about it. You see, when he's actually doing the then, it's so exciting that you forget all the danger. But when he's not doing the gun and you're sitting around, the danger is all you think about. Everyone I was at, I wanted to be the last, but I don't think it will be ever the last. In January 1967, the weather finally cleared. A record attempt was imminent. On the morning of the 3rd, when he called me, he actually told me he couldn't wait to get out of that dump. And I told him then that he mustn't be impatient. He always told me that impatience in a record attempt is poison. Oh, don't worry, I'm going to be careful for both of us. He was not in a good mood. We always had this thing, you hang up now, no, you hang up now. I said, you hang up now, darling. And he didn't answer, but he sort of said, look after yourself, won't you? And I said, yeah. And afterwards, I thought, why did he say that? That was the last time we spoke. It was a lovely frosty morning and uh, we were out on the lake quite early. Donald came on the radio to Leo and Leo said, yes, it's fine, you know, uh, the water's fine, you, you, you're ready to go and he cast off from the pier and you could see the boat coming out into the centre of the lake. And as it actually went past us, you knew it was going very fast. It was almost going on, like a camera shot, 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 as you were, you were trying to sort of catch up with it all the time. And then uh, the timekeepers came on with uh, a sort of coded message, which I think was plus 47, which is 297 miles an hour, which was very close to 300. So it, no doubt there was a temptation to try and push it a little bit further uh, on the way back. And then he made his, you know, started his return run. I never feared for my father's life, because he always came home. You didn't talk about the risk. It was the reward, it was the result that counted, not the risk. Bluebird K7 was more than 12 years old. She had been designed to break the 200 barrier. But fitted with a far more powerful engine, she was traveling at over 300 miles an hour. Aerodynamically, Bluebird was venturing into the unknown. It made an awful bang when it went back into the water but I actually have no recollection of any sound even to this day but I was sort of stood there quite honestly you know mouth open gaping at this thing and I remember Leo Villa giving me a crack on the shoulder and saying come on Robbie for God's sake let's get going and you know and get him out Christ that's his life jacket 
Have you got him, Leo? And then we saw his Mae West, and of course we thought initially that that was him, because we thought, you know, that uh, he, obviously he would be inside it. But it and as it turned out, it wasn't, you know, it had been ripped off. So I stayed around here from what, half past eight when the accident happened until nearly midday, and it really was quite eerie. I was working in a hotel in a ski resort, ironing away one morning, and I was called by the reception to a telephone call. As I'm walking up, I, it's very odd, I knew something was certainly not normal. I think my mind just closed down. I, I just remember thinking nothing, you know, just total blank. Extraordinary. I do love the beauty of it in all its seasons, but I did have problems coming here of just feeling physically sick. I wouldn't go on the water. It'd be like walking over my father's grave. But it's better now. 97, 98, Bill Smith from Newcastle rang me out of the blue and just said that he was an amateur diver and he was coming to Coniston and it was his desire and ambition to find my dad's boat. It was two years, three years later, he rang me again, excitedly screaming down the phone that he'd found it, he'd found it, he'd found it. And I said, if you bring the boat up, which you're going to have to do, you'll have to find my dad and bring my dad up as well. So Bill brought him up and we were finally able to lay my father to rest in a proper grave. It doesn't change the fact, but he's there and go and see him, put some flowers on the grave, say, hi, Dad, how's it going, Skipper? You know, where there's life, there's death, sad facts. I'd never smoked a cigarette in my life, not even when I was at school. And when I was with Donald, after dinner, we'd have a few drinks, and it then became a thing with him, because he liked a cigar. And he'd said, David, you've got to have a cigar. And in the end, after about four or five days, it was suddenly going to be easier to smoke a cigar than go on fighting with him over it. So I smoked a cigar, and I didn't like it at all. But the, by the time I'd smoked four, I changed my mind and I've smoked cigars ever since. Often when I light a cigar, I will think back to that time. And, um, and the memories of him are very real and very precious. His father had a much easier job driving his simpler cars at lower speeds and becoming a great national hero and getting his knighthood. Donald tried the same thing on much more difficult cars, going at much faster speeds in a very different world. But he wasn't taken seriously in the way his father was. And I think, though, that when you go beneath the surface of what was going on, you realise that this really was a man who was a much greater man than his father, a much more heroic man, much nicer man and a genuine hero. Probably will say I haven't grown up, and if that's uh, so, well, uh, 
quite prepared to accept it, and I'm in no hurry. There's too much time to grow up and grow old. I think Donald is the sort of hero we really need today, someone who is not phony, but on the other hand is not a pompous git. He wasn't a pompous git, he was a good guy. And he was very honourable. And so, today, as we finally lay to rest the skipper beside the lake and in the shadow of our mountains, I believe that he will have found that other bluebird, that bluebird of eternal happiness that inspired two generations of racing legends. No man deserves it more. Lironia Talhaya, Bnidam, that's a proud Min Paisu, Bnidam Le Hadam, Bishara El Paisu, Phil Uchata, Vdak, the sport particularly, the record star speed, Yitlef Haitu, tragicamente. Hanif U Al Pausa Tariklam Yohra, Metanijulura, Fitilat Party, Narau. Jaramina il K7 il Bluebird Album ritratti l'ora fismi l'ora fismi pai sotti millina fi millina fi ti hatta mia la matrit o che mi sti impara il fti li erja da che smin mel Jada kizmin min jdi. 